All right, guys. Is this thing on? Yeah, okay. Hey, everybody. So uh, everybody had their popcorn, so I assume they're ready for showtime, right? <laughs> so uh, hopefully you guys are either on a sugar high or you've come off your post-lunch crash. Um, welcome to our session. Obviously, uh, last session of the day before the keynote. Um, so obviously, being an admin hero, talking about best business uh, configuration practices, and happy to be presenting with this guy. Um, so we'll kick, some thing, kick things off. First things first, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our platinum sponsors for all the great food, the great setup, obviously their money uh, investing in the conferences that makes this enjoyable. So thanks to these four sponsors. Um, we're also gonna be sharing some resources before the end. So I just wanted to let you guys know, when, when I attend these kinds of conferences, as a participant, I'm always you know, jotting down notes and scrambling and taking screenshots and stuff. We're gonna give all the slides to you at the end. Uh, there'll be some resources that we talked about at the end as well. So you don't have to, have to stress that. We'd much rather have your engagement. Um, so show of hands, I'll go back one. Show of hands, who here has gone through configuration and you had to, you've been stumped in trying to figure out, okay, how do I solve for this in Salesforce? And you figure it out, but you're not totally sure if you've figured it out the right way, the best way. Show of hands. Okay. All right, so we have some hands down. Who here feels that they have um, really got a grasp, a very good grasp, like advanced grasp of best, best configuration practices? Okay, well that, feel, that, that makes me feel good. So we're having, we have the right audience, that's great. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a Detroiter at heart, and uh, I actually started uh, my first taste in Salesforce about 10 years ago, in uh, 2007. Uh, I was an accidental admin, and uh, came from the hospitality and banking industry, worked my way up, uh, was at an individual, uh, small, customer-based Salesforce user, and uh, I'm, I'm the, one of the co-leaders of the New York City User Group. I'm proud to, to share with you that I've co-founded a, a new nonprofit with Rivi De La Paz and a few other um, Salesforce users, Stephanie Herrera and uh, Selena Suarez. And uh, I joined Magnet, uh, my current company, in 2017, the very beginning. Um, so a little bit about the, the nonprofit that I started with um, our group. We, we feel like the pipeline right now, we all here at Diversity, there's not enough um, talent in the Salesforce ecosystem to kind of build towards the demand that we're seeing. And one of the ways I think we solve that is we need to really build a better pipeline for all the talent that's coming in. And a lot of companies aren't willing to take a gamble on people who aren't trained in certain areas. And one of the things, we're, obviously, you can see from Facebook and Google and Coca-Cola and Twitter in terms of their diversity numbers, their metrics, is it's not very well blended. So we started Pep Up Tech. Um, we're just getting started and launching it. It's all about people empowering people to move up in tech, and we're focusing on underrepresented communities. Um, we have two main programs. So there's a Pep Up Tech for summer explorers, kind of seven to 10 year olds, to help raise money so that they can go to a STEM-based summer camp and get exposure and play with robotics and play with code and get involved in making online apps. Um, so that's gonna happen in the Bronx. This summer, we're raising money for it, so wish us luck. And uh, the Salesforce College, College Summer Boot Camp, we did it last year before we really had launched this nonprofit. Um, and it was in New York, two colleges in New York. This year will be in Florida and New York. And it's about immersing college students who are computer science or management information systems kind of majors who are actually surprisingly not that versed in Salesforce. So it's about teaching them about the ecosystem, uh, building a curriculum, trailhead, it's a two-day immersive. And then we take that and try to build a mentoring program off of that and give them opportunities to internship and then hopefully towards certification. So um, we're really proud of that. And if you're interested in volunteering, there's teaching opportunities, there's volunteer opportunities online, there's also opportunities to donate if you or people you know that might be interested. Um, we think that our community and our industry needs more of that. So that's my spiel. All right. I'll take and, it over to uh, you. All right. Time for a quick word about me. Um, I'm from Atlanta, so I grew up in Roswell. I currently now live in Birmingham as of a year and a half ago. So not 
I'm still here pretty often. Uh, first started with Salesforce in 2012, so almost five years now. Um, feel kind of old now. Um, but I, just like Giuseppe, I, I started as a sales operations business analyst, so I wasn't initially out of college, hey, I want to be a Salesforce admin. Um, came on the sales side and then became the system admin and then moved over into the consulting world. Um, I kind of like certifications. Um, I am a Birmingham user group leader, so uh, I do that with uh, Chad over in there and enjoy um, the Birmingham user group. And then I started a blog called Salesforce Sidekick. So if you want to learn about flow, process builder, uh, starting to write a lot about Wave, I know not many people have it, but um, check that out. Hopefully you can find something that might be able to save you some time. And then I joined Avictorium um, a little over two years ago now. We're out of Alpharetta. Um, so headquartered there, but I am out of our Birmingham area. So, back over to you. So, have everybody take a look at this slide. So what's really interesting about this slide is that um, Salesforce and the human eye are not at all equal in terms of how you configure Salesforce. I only wish if Salesforce worked this way where you could, as long as you had all the letters and all the steps, but you didn't have to get them in the right order, you could still figure it out. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, but fascinating that our eyes do, um, unless like, we have too much screen time. <laughs> no, they don't. So with configuration, I want to go over some key themes that we'll talk about today, and then we'll get into kind of what the session is going to be about, who we're focused on for our audience in this session and some of the things we're not going to talk about today because configuration is a, is a big space. Um, so with configuration, user friendliness comes top of mind, right? Um, even though the solution works, is it practical? Is it the right kind of solution for what you're trying to solve for? Um, is it simple? Is it easy to understand? Um, could your design in what you've configured hinder user adoption? You know, have you built something that's going to have confusing steps? Um, that can also impact training. Are there any gotchas where, you know, once you've, once you've rolled this out, it's going to cause issues on the training side? Could that be, could that be smoothed out? Um, configuration versus development. This is a big area that David will talk about in his part of the presentation in terms of uh, a couple things. When should you be using automation and when shouldn't you? And also, um, is the business case strong enough to not use out-of-the-box functionality? So, I would suggest defaulting out-of-the-box functionality whenever possible. Um, so that, that should be your kind of your, your go-to default and then kind of um, expand from there if you need to go custom. Security. You know, is the solution secure? Um, do you need to restrict access to this functionality? A lot of times I think when I think of people who are configuring um, that I've worked with, the companies tend to want to go too constrictive or too restrictive, and that ends up hurting them. Um, there's a lot of times where there are creative ways to get around not having to go through every field and change field set um, visibility, but do it in simpler ways so that later, if that has to be undone, you have a lot, you have a lot more simple solution. Um, are there trade-offs that will be achieved um, for trade-offs that will still achieve MVP functionality? So minimal viable product, right? Like that should be the baseline of what we're thinking about whenever you're building something uh, in Salesforce for, for your customer or obviously in-house um, for your team, and then build off from there. Um, reporting, have you implemented a solution that um, in a manner that can be useful for reports? Or have you built something where you can't sort lots of checkboxes, so you're not going to be able to group them, which means your bar charts aren't going to look very sexy? Um, uh, will custom report types be needed to support the business case? And then scalability. Um, has this function been implemented in a manner where you know, it can be expanded upon in the future? The more custom you go, the more likely that's going to be a challenge. Um, we're seeing that with visual force right now with lightning. And, and anybody remember S controls? <laughs> and so if you've built those in the past, it obviously stunts the, the ability for this to become what everybody likes to talk about future proof, right? or having a long, a long lifespan. Um, so that's really important in terms of scalability. And also, are there certain important components that could break when changes are made? Um, I've broken things before. It's not fun. 
<laughs> when you start getting emails flying or you have lots of notifications because you've, your workflow is clearly not updating uh, and it's impacting a ton of users. So some configuration best practices. Uh, what this session will focus on, like I said, configuration is, is vast. We could, spend, we could have spent the whole day on configuration, so we don't have that much time. Um, there's a lot of areas to focus on. What we're going to focus on are a few, few key areas, and I'll, I'll just, this is kind of the, the, the caveat. There's a lot we could be covering, and we had to kind of figure out what's worth covering today. So we're going to focus on automation, we're going to focus on UI mainly, and touch on a few other areas. Um, and a few, a few kind of goodies in the bag to give you guys as far as resources. So this session will be in classic as far as interface. However, there's a lot of applicability to what we're showing that's very much um, compatible with Lightning as well. Uh, admins, this is really focused on admins who support uh, their users in-house. So who here in the room is an admin that's supporting in-house teammates? Okay, wow, most of you. Great, um, solo admins who wear many hats. Can I see a show of hands of who's a solo admin? Nice. Um, consultants who are advising, obviously, uh, interfacing with external clients. Any, any consultants in the room? You raised your hand a few times. <laughs> okay, so we have a few. And, uh, and power users who have influence in their Salesforce org. Do we have anyone that's a user aspiring to be an admin? Nice. All right, cool. So that's who we're focusing on. You, you're the perfect audience. Can I, can I just rate you guys a 10 right now? Uh, so UI considerations. Let's talk about what, what's coming to mind when you're going to create an object or a tab in Salesforce, right? So fundamentals, um, remembering to enable reporting whenever you're creating a custom object. Um, that's important. Uh, you also want to ma make sure that tab order is succinct. It, it makes sense. It's relevant to their position. You know, there's a whole ton of tabs that you can have as a default. You, you don't want those for specific users that you want to focus them on certain um, processes. Remember, custom apps always give you more flexibility. So you can custom white label them. You can set up lots of custom settings uh, that you can't do as far as default home page, uh, landing page, and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's an easy one. Um, review every app, because the app list can be really long in Classic. A lot of that's not necessary. You can turn a lot of that off for your users and simplify it, and also simplify what's, what tabs are in the app that they're currently using. Screen real estate. So a huge criticism of Classic. Two columns, kind of boring. Not a lot you can do with it. Um, so one way you can optimize that is you can now enable the Salesforce um, Service Cloud Console for even Sales Cloud. It it's actually comes with your license now. It's, it's kind of a giveaway. Uh, surprising that Salesforce opened that up, but hey, I'm not going to put it out to them. It's something you can utilize today. The power of search. So who here has actually gone a, uh, for a search on an org that you've started working on and you get like three columns back? Results. And they're all they're all saying United States. You know they're all saying um, type is client prospect and the names. Very it's very hard to discern for your users what they're actually looking for and, and being able to locate records, especially with the volume that a lot of orgs have. So remembering to update all the layouts. So I'll run through a few examples for these. So the don't uh, up top. I mean, look at all these tabs. If I'm if I'm a sales rep, do I need to be seeing solutions? And do I need to be seeing um, you know, uh, campaigns? I'm not a marketing person, so I don't need to see all of that. Whereas here, it's cleaned up and it makes sense. You know, Chatter and all your activity on the left. You need accounts because that's the baseline. That's like the trunk of your tree. And then you have your branches, your contacts, your leads that lead to opportunities. Once you have opportunities, they lead to quotes. Quotes have products and orders in them. And eventually dashboards and, and reports. So simple things like that. Also, optimizing screen real estate. Can I just say, ugly. Like, there's nothing here. Look at all this. Like, it's, so this is the standard case object, right? Let's turn on the Salesforce Service Console. You have a lot more you can do with it. You've got a customizable feed on the right that's, that's collapsible as an accordion. Uh, you can put any related list object up there. You've got a utility bar. 
a la kind of what you're seeing in Lightning, but kind of it was pre-Lightning. So there's three custom objects here, macros, history, and knowledge. I'm showing a history tab, which shows everything that they've looked at recently by object, and you can also bookmark them. Custom feed on the left, which is kind of like the one on the right. Um, in this instance, it's open activities, activity history, and case comments. And then your quick actions are a little more interesting to look at. So there's a lot more there. Plus, let's not forget all the, you can have this all in one tab on your browser and have all the mini tabs and you can control um, how many are there. Plus you have shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts, which who doesn't love keyboard shortcuts? So uh, how did we do this? I just wanted to show the setup for that. Pretty simple. You're going into setup. You're picking your desired profile. You want to make sure you're turning on. This is the example of the default sample console, but as I said earlier, you would want to create a custom app. And then you would just brand that custom app and enable it for service console. The other change you need to make is enabling it at the user level. And that's it. And they're rolling. Just make sure you have it checked with the service cloud user and you're good to go there. I mean, uh, It should, yeah. and that would be a great thing on the idea exchange. I agree. It's not intuitive, but it's, it's something that is, is, from my experience, if you don't have it, it won't work. So let me actually ask if just we can, we're going to get through the agenda. We want to, both David and I want to leave enough time for questions at the end, but I'll, we can come back to yours. Um, the power of search. So again, this is out of the box, right? Account name, billing city, and phone. Not that helpful. Uh, and also, remember, you can change all kinds of things in search with search layout. So the lookups. Who here has had a relationship lookup where you click it and you basically get that? Okay, so Mark Benioff, United Oil and Gas. That's all you have. What if you have thousands of Mark Benioffs or Tom Johnsons or Joe Smiths? Not very useful, but if you enable a little bit more priority on what you're looking to order, what fields, by what field types, in terms of your home page for accounts, I have a wealth of information here, and it's ordered in a way that makes sense. And then I also look at my lookup search. So now I know Parker Harris, he reports to Mark Benioff, I've got his email, I know his assistant, all just through the related lookup. Very simple way you can improve your Salesforce interface just by enhancing search. So how did we do that? We just went to setup and search layouts, and then you have all the search layouts. The account example you saw is the account tab for global search. And then on the contact search layout, it's a, uh, it's a phone dialogue lookup. Or actually, sorry, this is wrong. It's the lookup dialogue, not the lookup phone dialogue. My slide's wrong. But very simple uh, and easy to change quickly. Sometimes it's the little things, and we think it's the big things, but sometimes it's the little things that our users are actually pretty wowed by or appreciate. So page layouts, consistency. Consistency is king. Um, especially when you set up an org where you have you know, 10 or 20 or 30 record types on one object and then double that in page layouts. It can get, you know, if you keep, keep using the, the arrow at the top and you know, you're scrolling through all of them, to build that consistency is really important because um, obviously if the pages are different and the fields are located in different places um, and they're using the same fields on different page layouts, your users will get very confused and they'll end up coming to you, I'm sure, you know, and saying, I don't know where that is. I, I didn't know that field existed. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, grouping related data. So using those subsections to kind of break out data. Uh, I always look at status. Like if you think of cases, having a status section where you have like follow-up dates, you have case status, you have um, due dates, things like that. Grouping those together uh, makes it a lot easier. Also thinking about the tab direction so who here is tabbed through on the keyboard and it starts going this way and then it goes this way and then it goes this way and then it goes this way. You know, that, that's just a, an obvious one. But again, if you're managing 30, 40, 50 page layouts, something to really keep in mind. Um, one column versus two. So generally, your large rich text boxes, HTML text box, your large text box area, or multi pick lists should be in one column. And then everything else can be in two. It's a preference thing, but, but I certainly wouldn't put the, the, the first three things, the large text box and the multi-select pick list in a, in a two-column format. 
you can also hide your one column under a two column heading, right? So you have your, you know, it's the um, due date status in that section, and then you can have below that comments as a one column, but hide it under the detail view. So it still looks like it's part of the same section, but it, it actually has the form factor of a wider margin. Um, so simple things like that. Um, so where do you put your backend formulas? Um, don't hide them from your system admin. And what I mean by that is, if you have formulas that don't need to display on the page for your user, great. Then just enable visibility for your system admin. And, and I always put them at the bottom. Because if you put them at the bottom under system info, you know that your, your system admin can go down and say, yep, that's triggering that checkbox. OK, so that's one that's saying ignore assignment rules. Check. That's one that's saying that this is a record, a record type that's being counted for in some workflow or some validation rule. But if they're hidden, you make it really hard for them to be able to troubleshoot what's working, what's not working functionality-wise. And also, I would, I would advocate if you have a, um, a use case where you're working with power users who are doing kind of user adoption testing, don't hide it on them either. Let them see it. Let them be able to go through and kind of test those and validate that they're working correctly. You'll drive yourself bananas if you hide it. Um, record owner and record types. Now, this is, this is more of a, a preference thing, but I would always advocate rise them to the top. These are really important fields to see who owns. And if they're buried way down at the bottom of the page, uh, it creates a lot of scrolling. And oftentimes, there are things where you want to be changing record types. So keep them together, and I would suggest bundling them up top. Um, the cost of inline editing. So inline editing is great. However, just keep in mind that cases and lead assignments, uh, lead assignment rules, don't always work and don't fire if you're on inline editing. You have to often go to edit the entire page for those to fire or refresh your browser. Um, so a couple of examples. Uh, actually, I'll touch on the related list, and then we'll go to a couple of examples. So only show what matters on page layouts. Um, I mean, on related lists. Um, just think of it as, uh, you know, the more columns you have, the less field space you have for each column, the more hard it is to read, and the, and the less relevant information. So only show what matters for who you're assigning that page to. Uh, think through the ordering process in terms of priority. Remember the right hover state as well. You can, you can hover on records that are related lookups, and you can have additional fields there. So the user can still see more content on Mark Benioff and his department and his email. But it doesn't have to all be in the records related list. And that way, they can see what they need to see without having to clutter the page. Um, and the, the hover state for the, the um, smaller menu is a mini page layout. And you can adjust that in the page layout, too, right at the top. So that can be, that can be customized. Uh, how many columns are you giving your users um, for the essentials to differentiate their records? So one thing I like to share is process, just a little kind of goodie, is using a methodology where you have a checklist, where you can literally go through when you're setting up page records and la page layouts. So I've been using Google Keep. What's great about Google Keep is you can create a checklist really easy, and it syncs online. Um, I recommend online because I mean, if you're mobile, if you're on your phone, if you're under a different browser and you sign in, it still works and it, it syncs with your, your profile, uh, even a guest computer. And it now interfaces with Google Docs. So on Google Drive, you're able to, have, you're able to build in your checklist and you can even port them right into, uh, from notes right into an actual Google Doc. So a handy tool. There's other online checklists that you can use as well, just to kind of keep your process consistent. Um, we went through this already. Ah, these are more, sorry. Um, so yeah, who are, the, view, who are the, the list views? Who's seeing them? Certain teams, and you want to make sure you're restricting them. Um, you can do that by page layout um, controls. So certain related lists are not relevant on, on a lot of pages. Um, you want to ensure that the right users and only those users have access to create public list views. So, who here is, uh, you're logged into Salesforce and you see a list when you click on list views and it's like 50 long and it's, it's everything. I mean, it's starting with like acronyms you've never heard of and people's initials you don't know. Um, why is that public, right? You can restrict that so that your users aren't, because the more cluttered the, the list view menu is, the less likely people are going to use it. And then when you ask them, you know, 
this is right here, this resource, you can see this list view, they're gonna look at you like, I didn't know that existed, right? Um, when creating the custom objects, um, building a standard set of list views is highly recommended. So every time you build out that, that custom object with specific fields that are within view. Um, and then inline editing on a list view. So for list views, if you want inline editing, remember you have to filter the logic to be a specific record type. Otherwise, it's not gonna be enabled. You're not gonna see that beautiful little pencil. Uh, you're also not gonna see the pencil for like multi, well, multi-select pick list just, just came on board, but there's certain fields like changing the stage of an opportunity, things like that that you can't do, but 90% of the fields you can inline edit, you just have to filter it. The other gotcha with Salesforce is that inline editing doesn't work if you have a field, um, the wizard logic says or, instead of and, 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 in terms of your filter criteria, or if you have more than five, more than the default five, you lose your list inline editing, so keep that in mind. Um, make list views have more power like reports, so I like this one. Reports are great because you can see data from multiple objects, right? So I can have an account report that has contacts and maybe has contact relationships or maybe a junction object. But list views generally are only going to contain what's in that particular object, whatever's on that page. So use cross object formulas. Aha. Uh -huh. And then you can build on fields that are not related to that particular object but show up there. So there, there's your don't. This is a great example of a list view of all the list views saved on a specific object. You know, personalized lists from the, from the user. Why is that public? Um, you've got nondescript, um, just someone's name. I have no idea what that does. And I'm sure most of your users wouldn't know either. So poor attention to, to kind of naming convention obviously hinders adoption. And the do's is, this is like, this makes my heart sing. <laughs> you've got everything categorized, you've got it obviously alphabetized, so, because Salesforce will default to um, alphabetic, alphabetize every list view. Um, and it's by department, and then it's by function or process, and then it's by status, and that's consistent throughout. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, also, if you're, if you're delegating this work, you can put together a training piece on this. And that way you know when it's being built out that um, everybody will, there'll, there'll be consistency in terms of how it's executed. Um, here's your cross object uh, formulas. So I'm looking at opportunities, um, this is just a list view, but I can see billing city and billing state, which is pulling from the account object. So it's great, because now I can filter and sort by um, things that aren't normally on the opportunity object. You can do this with anything that is a one-to-many relationship. Um, so there's lots of use cases for this. A um, couple examples, you can have account information showing up on the opportunity list views. You could have for a salesperson opportunities, um, opportunity information showing up on quotes or on orders. And then service, you know, you could have contact details showing up on a case view, which is really helpful. Um, so simple way we did this uh, is going into opportunities. It's a really simple, simple formula field. Um, and then in the, in the formula editor, it's just a reference to the account and that, that specific field. This is a, uh, a nice little goodie as well. I use a, a formula editor uh, because I don't like the default formula editor. So if you like Chrome and you use Chrome, this is a great um, extension for enhanced formula editor. Uh, you're actually able to find all kinds of field details. You can look up by, um, it's cool because it shows you the, how many times that field is used in different formulas. Um, it gives you links directly to the field itself to edit if you, wanted, you, know, if you needed to change it or look at it. Field label, uh, it also gives you sub details. So it's, very, it's, it's a great, great little tool. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Oh yeah, you have the mic. All right, thanks, Chevy. Salesforce Enhanced Formula Editor. Highly recommend it. All right, so um, we're gonna go over an automation decision guide here. Um, so I've got three slides um, kind of covering the, the differences between workflow, process builder, flow, and Apex and Visual Force. I'm not gonna go through each one of these little columns because we're gonna let you get this slide later if you want. Um, 
So I'm just going to kind of touch on a few of the, the key highlights here, and then we'll get into some conversations around this. All right. So um, with workflow, um, you know, that's going to be really an, a single if condition. You, you're building one workflow rule, and then you can have actions that fire off of that. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the use case of workflow. Process builder, you can have tons of different conditions as different sets of criteria, and then you can have different actions that fire off of each of those different uh, sets of criteria. Within flow, it's kind of its own little world because you can have it triggered from Apex, process builder, a button, um, a visual force page. Flow, flow kind of just is off in its own world, um, but it has a lot of power. And then Apex and visual force, um, you know, is, is typically used with native declarative clicks. Um, and when functionality, you know, out of the box does not fit that user's needs um, is when you typically would go into Apex and Visual Force or if you needed a very customized user experience. Um, in terms of when these execute, um, there is a little bit of a difference between them. Um, most of them edit, um, edit, create, you know, covers all of them. However, um, Apex is the only one that will fire on delete. So if you needed to have something happen when a record was deleted, you're not going to be able to do that with workflow or process builder. So that's a little bit of a gap there. Um, we've got some nice checkboxes that kind of cover this in a little bit more detail. Um, if you needed to um, you know, do something that was going to touch a lot of records, so let's say you had an integration of some sort. You know, you're pushing in accounting information into Salesforce to store that there. That kind of, you know, depending on how many records you're talking about, you, you need to be paying attention to that bulkified um, slide up or line up there. So um, process builder and flow in theory are now bulkified. I have rarely ran into those issues that I used to run into. Um, so it, it really is improved, but you want to test it. So um, there's a great, for bulkify, there's a, a website called Makaroo. Um, you can just Google it and you can export for free like a thousand records at a time and then you just pick the fields and it'll give you test data. So you can just hit your org with a thousand records and make sure it works. Um, so bulkification, that's a big one. Uh, and you know, record creation, that's one that you, know, you can't do with workflow, so you would need to move in process builder or visual force or flow. Um, so let's keep on moving here. Um, one of the things to note, uh, you know, submit approval cannot happen in workflow rules. So you kind of see you know, there's a few things here that workflow rules can't do that everything else can. But workflow rules do have send outbound message. Um, so that's something that you can't do with process builder or flow unless you were doing that through Apex. Uh, so if you were doing an outbound message through Apex, uh, then you could. But if, you, if you're wanting a declarative outbound message, you got to go with workflow or Apex for it. Um, so that's, that's a good use case to still use workflow rules. So let's talk about some best practices. And to do that, you've got to talk about Lord of the Rings. So. For, um, for this, you know, how would you go about destroying the one ring? If, if you just got this in your pocket and you got to figure out how you're going to destroy it, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about doing that. And that's how it is with Salesforce and automation. You know? um, the first thing is, what's your team? So if you're you know, a full team of elves, that's probably going to be a different trip to Mordor than this group. You know? So um, you got to take into account, it's, it's really org specific. Um, if you're all hobbits, then that's you know different from you know all um, all wizards. Uh, so you got to take into account who you're working with and the skill sets of each of those people. If you don't, then you might not build the right solution for your company. All right, and then you got to think about your resources. So when I think of resources, I think of money, and then I also think of time. So if you have something that you know. You have a million dollars to spend on a, just a regular sales cloud implementation, but you only have a week, that, that's going to impact what actually you can do in that week. Um, so money and time, how those relate, that's, that's going to have an impact on, you know, do I go code, do I go out of the box, how, how, how much am I going to do from each of those? And then also you got to take into the size of your org. If I'm at a 50 person company or a 10 person company, that's going to be a lot different than a 2,000, 20,000 person company. You know, so, you know, what, what are your users doing in Salesforce? How many do you have? Um, that, that all has a big impact on you know, what recommendation you should have around automation. 
Um, and to kind of speak to this a little bit um, more, um, if, if you're, you know, 2,000 person org and you've got a lot of complicated processes in there, you probably have a lot of developers as well with you. So you're probably going to be doing a lot more code. You're probably not going to have as many workflow rules and process builders because you're going to have a team of developers there that are going to be able to support that code. So you really have to take into account that team, your, your resources, and then you know, the size of your org is going to matter. So there's not like a right way, okay, so once you, know, you hit 20 users, you have to start using process builder and flow and no more workflow rules. It's, it's not that easy. Um, I've heard people say, you know, once you have one line of Apex in there, then you shouldn't, you know, you should scrap all the workflow rules and process builders on that object and now move it all into Apex because that cons consolidates it. So the, that's, you know, up in the air. Do you have developers that can maintain that? Or was it just a quick little trigger to do one thing that you really needed done? So you, you got to kind of, there's not a right answer, but you just have to kind of weigh the, the options. So. Going back to the, the do's and don'ts, um, definitely don't do this. So this, this goes back to that Apex example I just talked about. So we've got a workflow rule, we've got process builder, and we've got flow. This is three separate areas that I have to go to to maintain this process. So what, to walk through this process, we've got sending an email alert to accounting. This is a closed one opportunity. So we want to alert accounting. We want to create a project. You know, we have an implementation now, whether you're consulting or um, you know, another field that, you know, has to onboard your customer, you know, we need to create that project. So we'll do that in Process Builder and then we'll fire off a flow because we need to go do some more complicated stuff, look up records and then update other records. Um, so we'll, you know, send our Process Builder in flow. And then also after we've created our project and updated it to the right owner, we want to send out another email alert. So, you know, all that if I was an admin and I had to maintain that, I, I'd pull my hair out because I have to go check three different areas and try to see how they all relate when they trigger and it's just not very easy. So let's see if we can do better. But not yet quite there. So we've got Process Builder. We now move the email alerts into Process Builder and Flow. But we still have multiple actions in Process Builder and multiple actions in Flow. So we're, you know, it's, it's definitely easier for you to digest but it's still a little bit more of a headache than you need to have for one process. So think about, you know, well, we could probably create that email alert and that project all in flow. So why don't we do this? We just have a process builder, launch a flow, and do all those actions in the flow. Um, and that, that way we're consolidating that process. It's a lot easier for you to understand and to maintain. You go to one spot, you don't have to go to three places to make that update. So think about the, you know, maintainability of what you're doing. All right, so Giuseppe, I'll meet you at Chick-fil-A, all right? So don't give him directions like this. Don't exit the hotel, take a left on Peachtree. There's only 50, or sorry, 71 variations of Peachtree in Atlanta. And then turn a left on Piedmont, and then Chick-fil-A will be on your right. That's pretty vague. Um, you know, you want to give exact street um, references, you know, turn left on Peachtree Road. Um, you know, turn left on Piedmont Road Northeast. All that kind of detail you want to be very specific with how you give um, your directions to your automation, so your criteria. If, if you're vague, you might have a process builder that fires and accidentally sends out a workflow to 2,000 of your clients. I've never seen that happen. Um, so you, you really have to be very cautious and very paranoid when you're writing your process builders, workflow rules. Anything with an email really needs to be very carefully watched. I've seen it happen many times. So um, just keep that in mind. So moving on to the next one, uh, we have some process builder best practices here. So inside a process builder, um, right here we have, we'll say, uh, we're, let's say we've got a drop down where dynamically based off of how much revenue we've got on an account, we want to update a pick list so that we have a pick list and list views and stuff that we can filter accounts by and it reports by, because you could do that with a formula field, but then you have to type in the values. So when you push a value dynamically into the field, the pick list field, now you have a, a, a good field for people to report on and put into list views. So with that, you know, all we need to know is the revenue amount changed. That's the only real criteria we need to know, and we can then send it into this immediate actions and then have everything update, right? Wrong. So what's happening, every single one of those actions is, is actually hitting the system and it's causing it to take more time. 
So when you're writing Process Builder, you really want to be careful of that. So the real way that you should write something like this is going to take you a lot more time. This is tedious um, to have to do compared to the other way, but this is going to be more efficient because this is first checking to see what that revenue amount is before going and updating the value. So you're you know, going to have a little bit more to click through and it's going to look longer, but you're going to be more efficient. So when you're building out these process builders, um, which are great you know, declarative tools for us admins to use and not have to write code and really it takes your game to the next level, you have to be conscious of how long is it going to take for me to hit that save button? Because if you start having a record create and then a record update and then an email alert, all this stuff happen in the back end before that transaction finishes, I've seen it where quick actions can take like five, seven seconds before it hits save and the page refreshes. So you, you do need to be careful of that because if you don't optimize it to where it's faster, that's going to not, you're not going to notice it, but your end users will. And it's going to make it a little bit annoying for them when uh, they're trying to, you know, make an update. Especially something like this because that's a field that would probably, you know, get updated on regular saves. All right. Another thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with uh, Salesforce is memberships and associations. So one of the great things about Apex that I really love that I wish Process Builder and Flow had was the ability to check for those relationships. Um, so in this case, uh, we've got things like permission set assignments. We've got things like public group memberships. All these kind of you know, relationships that we as admins put on our users um, or contacts, add, adding them in different places, those will cause errors and your flow will, get a, your, your flow will cause people not to be able to save records because you're going to get that lovely unhandled message error. Um, so keep in mind when you are doing any sort of membership or association, you really need to pay attention to, um, you know, normally send that into Flow or Apex so you can query and see if that membership already exists. Run into that quite often. Um, and then we've got Visual Flow versus Visual Force. And this really comes down to that, that you know, what's your team? What's the composition of your team? Um, can this be done with a simple Visual Flow? Or do we need to go custom and write a Visual Force page? You know, who's going to be maintaining that six months now, or six months down the road, a year from now, what, what is this going to look like? Is this something that's dynamically going to change? Like, is it going to be two, two months later, your marketing manager says, hey, we need to have this updated to, you know, include some more fields? And if, if it's just a simple pick list update, maybe, um, you know, it wouldn't be too bad to still go visual force. Or maybe it's going to be more than that, and you want to go visual flow because it's going to be something that changes you know, every week and you're the admin that's got to maintain this. So think about, you know, how often is this going to change? Is this a very static thing or is this, you know, very fluid? And then we've got, uh, you know, flow screen queries and field sets. So who here, anyone know what field sets are from the admin side? Got a few people. Okay. So field sets allow you to select a list of fields declaratively from an admin perspective and those fields can be just pulled in to a visual force page. Um, similar to that in Visual Flow, we've got queries. So there's dynamic record lookups in Flow. So you can query records um, and then reference those values inside of Flow or do a regular lookup. Um, so think about when you are building something. Is it something that I could put in an, uh, another object in Salesforce or through like a field set somewhere that, you know, maybe I just maintain that one spot outside of the Flow, outside of the Visual Force, and then I, I go and update that there. So that way you don't have to hard code things in. You know, you've, you've probably heard it just about every session or blog post, like don't hard code IDs and other things because that will break. So, you know, think about, you know, how can you use a query to dynamically, you know, make these updates and make it something that you can do through the UI as, as like a record or, you know, through the page layout editor or through the object ed editor for field sets. So um, with that in mind, once again, those are the resources and thank you for your time. And I think we got a few minutes before uh, Chris is. So if anyone has questions, we're more than happy to take those.
This is a uh, contact lookup on a case, yeah. and you only want to see accounts. You said yeah. accounts that. Well, in standard out of the box Salesforce, the relationship lookup screens, you can't assign logic to it. So by default, you're not going to be able to restrict that. Uh, what you could do is you could do through a custom button, launch um, a visual force page that would actually have logic that assigns, okay, only show people who have ownership to not only this case, but are also um, on other cases related to that account, related to that root account. Um, it's not going to be a search, search specific setting that you can change though. Uh, any other ideas on that? Yeah, I know that depending on the type of lookout, you can add filters to lookouts, or sorry, lookouts, lookups. Look um, so there oh, are sometimes, and, and that's true. I, I don't know if that's a scenario that's probably not working for you, but you also have visual flow. So you can throw a button if you don't want to write a visual force page. There's a dynamic record lookup, which will just run the queries based off of your filters. So that's pretty quick and easy to set up, and then you can go after, you know, hit the next button and it saves. So. Uh, no, and you're at the Birmingham User Group, so you can find me. And we, can, <laughs> we can talk. Even better. Actually, I don't go back to just I uh, didn't think through the. I haven't had enough coffee. Clearly, um, on the filtering, the filter logic you can assign. If you want to restrict it, you can make it required filtering which will limit what your users see. Or you can make it optional, which gives you the, the query results that are confound to that filter. And they can click to say, show me all results, which you may, you may want to restrict it or not. But in the logic, you have suggested logic where you can, through formulas, you can say, OK, only show where the contact ID equals the same account ID as, um, or the same case, the same, the same account ID for that contact versus other contacts. Um, there's, there's definitely formula logic you can assign. That particular one, I'm, I'm not sure if, if the query would get it done. Yeah, you have to typically know how to, what they're, yeah, that's why the visual, visual flow or visual force will give you the more of a, like a pick list option. So you don't have to think and search through the contacts. So. Right. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, in fact, there's two sign-ups here. Um, where you can email, email me as well. But if you want to put your name and email here for either the nonprofit or if you want to get the deck and that automation decision tool that David toured us through. Yes, sir. So it's um, the, the kids that were doing the, the STEM-based summer program. It's actually just technology, innovation, robotics, um, science, mathematics, whereas the Salesforce boot camp for the college students and is Salesforce specific. Uh, we, we hope actually to partner with groups like Cano and uh, some of the kind of I, IoT providers with their products to kind of bring lab kind of um, setting to what they can do. And, and of course, we're talking to Trailhead about extending what's ostensibly available in Trailhead to a broader use of audience, uh, which is something that they're actually very interested in. Thanks. Other questions? You, you had a question earlier. I don't know if we skipped over or covered it. So, I think there's. Uh, you, do, you do have to have the license. You have to have the license. Um, it's the same price now as Sales Cloud, so you might not have it like already enabled. But if you were typically a newer, a newer org normally has that there. Um, it depends on what level of uh, addition you have. What level of addition are you in? You're an enterprise, so I think it's actually. Um, I think it's included now in enterprise. It I think you could switch should, over. It should be. But it is a request, so you, you probably will have to request your AE to turn on the service console capabilities so that you can then adjust that setting, if, if you're in Sales Cloud. Hmm. Well, so that's, that's a good question. I, it really depends on, depends on your industry. Um, so what industry are you in? Software development? Okay. 
So, I mean, some of the considerations around Lightning, uh, have you run the li Lightning migration tool? <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, because Spring 17 had a lot of enhancements for, for Lightning uh, that enabled it. Do you, do you have some, I mean, it really comes down to, are there really key gatekeepers that are um, must-haves that are kind of deal breakers? Because what I would advocate is, if you go through the mi migration tool and you look at your user group, your, your users, are there certain departments that, that right now, like there are some real quick wins that they would get by, by setting them up in Lightning? You could enable Lightning by groups or by profiles. Okay. If you're, if you're like within three months or so or three to six months of going to Lightning anyway, I wouldn't put your users through the pain of first introducing Service Console and all of that piece of adoption and then going into Lightning after that. I, because Lightning in itself has a lot of setup and customization that you can do. I would suggest just going to Lightning. Yeah, it's a lot of retraining of, of users. So if you're able to, try to go to Lightning. It's, it's gotten a lot better. What's that? Any other questions? I know we have Chris, Chris Duarte in eight minutes, so I want to respect everyone's time. Thank you all. Thanks Thank for you. attending. Appreciate it.